advice that we should rigidly uh, adhere to in terms of our own dining and inviting practices. And I'll get to that a little bit later. This is identified by Luke as a parable, this first part of the reading. The second is more advice to the host who invites him, but there are more than just meals at play here. Jesus is talking about something else. He is not simply providing a lesson in alternative etiquette. There's a criticism of the logic of some of these meals that we attend. The logic of obligation, the logic of status, the logic of advantage and gain is malnourishing. We should reject it. We should leave it behind. He talks about these places of honor that people have at a wedding banquet, as described here. But you sense very clearly that these are not necessarily places of honor where this is an event, but these are reinforcements of places of power, of influence, of the existence of the hierarchy as it stands. This ranking of guests is both terrifying in many ways, and it is at best unfestive, right? Trying to figure out in what order we should sit. Can you imagine how terrifying this would be if you're a mid-level official and you're invited to a wedding? Like, well, I don't necessarily know how many people have been invited. I don't necessarily know who hasn't been invited. I'm the leader of this, but I'm not the leader of that. How do you know? Complex at best and fraught with peril. The second story about who to invite who to invite to a luncheon or dinner, invite those who cannot repay you. The logic of recompense is all too human. Oh, well, they invited us over. We should probably have them over at some point. It's natural to us, right? We think about it all the time. But in essence, it is dismal. It is dreary, and it is dry. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't invite your friends over, despite Jesus' prohibition here. But it's to say that we probably shouldn't be keeping a record of who did what and when. We shall probably shouldn't be keeping a record of all of these things. Social science can enumerate all the factors why. Rank, hierarchy, recompense, competition in recompense, repayment, all of these things exist and enumerate why this operates at levels of very fancy banquets and very informal dinners. And we could get into that but I've been given a little bit of a time limit, so we probably won't get into that. I will point out that although we can explain it, although we can identify it, although we can identify with it, none of it makes for a very good party. An intense critic of the church, Frederick Nietzsche, once put it this way. The trick is not to arrange a festival but to find people who can enjoy it. And we can identify with that, at least I can. We shouldn't pat ourselves on the back too hard that, man, thank goodness we've left back those first century mores about weddings and banquets and dinners, and we have a much more egalitarian and much more open, especially in the Pacific Northwest, feeling about these things. Do we? Are our dining practices, are our feasting practices any more enlightened, any more nourishing than those? One of my favorites, honestly, and this maybe reveals a little bit too much about me, is at uh, dinner parties. Anybody remember dinner parties? I remember I used to go to dinner parties, right? Maybe we'll do that again someday, right? We can hope, we can pray, we can get there. But it's that awkward moment at a dinner party, right? You've arrived a little bit late, but not too late. You've already started your drinks. The small bites are out and you've enjoyed or probably demolished them depending on how hungry you are. The table is set, it looks lovely. The main dish is just about ready or maybe ready or maybe even on the table and you are ushered or you are invited into the dining room and then you stop. And the color drains from your face and you break out into a cold sweat because you have no idea where you're supposed to sit. Where do I go? What do I do? I don't know. 
If you're anything like Elise, you're watching the host, if they may be around looking for like nonverbal cues about what's going on. If you're like me, you're saying, okay, that chair's a little bit more worn than that chair. So somebody sits there a lot. Maybe the carpet can reveal like, well, there's this one, this chair has slid a lot back and forth, so I won't sit there. And you're starting to panic. Especially if you're not the only set of guests that are there. If there's another set of guests, now it's a competition and you've got to know <laughs> the safe seats to sit in before they do, otherwise you are doomed. And in the most delightful, the most awkward situation happens when one of the hosts says, oh, sit anywhere, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's a trap, don't do it, right? You cannot believe that. They want you to feel at home, but there is a place for you to sit. And why they don't just tell you is beyond me. But we do this in different ways at bigger parties, right? If you go to a wedding, oftentimes you're given a number, right? And it's not hard not to think about this number as a ranking. Ooh, I'm at table three. You are at table 27. <laughs> may or may not be in this room. It may or may not be behind a pillar. I don't really know. Now the table arrangement may be weird and the room may be oddly shaped, so maybe 27 is actually a pretty good table, but then you have to look at the guests you're sitting with, right? Are these the beloved cousins? Is this the party table? Have you lucked out? Or is this the random people from work? People who don't know each other, people who don't want to be there but have come out of obligation. Where do you rank in this system? So we say, okay. I'm going to avoid some of this. We're going to be more civilized than this. You know, this isn't a big fancy wedding. Let's just, let's just go out, right? That'll simplify things, right? That, that'll be fine. It won't. I can tell you why it won't be fine in two questions. The first question is, well, where should we go? Oh, and we're off to the races, right? Because now you're constantly thinking, well, I got to suggest something that they like but I don't want to eat here and I don't want to eat there and like, what's my price point? What's their price point? I don't know, how does this go? And you say, oh, well, why don't we just go eat here? And then inevitably it comes back. No, I ate there yesterday, let's do something else. And on we go. The second question is even more fun because maybe you've picked a decent place, maybe you've found a good table, maybe you've had a delightful time and the next question comes, and it has to come from outside, right? The server comes and says, so is that gonna be one check? <laughs> and you start to think, well, I invited them, so I, I mean, I, what, but, but then I paid last time we ate out, so I don't know, and I didn't wanna come here anyway. I wanted to go there, and on and on we go. We haven't really progressed very long. We've just changed the rules, but the game remains the same. I think what we're getting at here is if you focus on your own honor, you will only ensure your disgrace. If you give to seek advantage, you have already lost and there is no chance of gain for you or for anyone else. For it is God who exalts. It is God who blesses in these situations and in all situations. I would again argue that these are illustrations and these are parables designed to make us think. These are not adequate, etiquette lessons. Applied too rigidly, again, it only changes the rule of the game. Everyone rushes for the lowest seat in order to be honored, in order to be brought up. It's still a competition. It's still a ranking in a hierarchy. The outcome, thankfully, is out of our control. God exalts and God blesses. I would say that we are intended then to read this and to abandon hierarchy. You can't all be last. You should try this. It's super fun. And again, reveals a little bit much about me because it's super awkward. Invite as many priests as you can to dinner. And then serve it buffet style. And you say, okay, go ahead, get your food and watch them, right? They all want to be last. They all will stare at each other and they'll shift around and they don't know what to do. It doesn't have to be Episcopal priests. It can be clergy really of any denomination, but it's super fun. The problem is 
humility is what the goal is here, but humility is one of the greatest virtues, but it cannot be actively sought. For the minute that you recognize that you have achieved humility, you have abandoned humility. We're trying to think about something else. What if we arranged our dinners so that the hungriest people ate first? Or if it's a complex dinner, maybe with a dish you're not familiar with, somebody who knows what they're doing can go first and show us what to do. How to cut this, how to crack that, how to do all these things. And what if we helped everyone find a comfortable seat? It is God who exalts, and it is God who blesses. We abandon hierarchy, and we also abandon repayment, right? Table fellowship is not to keep a ledger. Table fellowship is designed to bring joy, to let love flow around the table, forward and back and again. Relationships in life are seldom equal. We don't have trying to maximize all this equality, whether in income or in cooking ability or in any of these things. The roles of guest and the roles of host provide mutual graces for one another, despite how many times you've been in one or how many times you've been in another. It is God who exalts, and it is God who blesses. So in this dining gospel, it is almost as if Luke is providing us a plan, maybe a menu, if you will, for how to see, for how to live into, for how to even taste the inbreaking kingdom of God. We are on a program in Luke's gospel of training. Training in being exalted, training in being blessed. And it may consist, at least in part, maybe in large part, in more and better feasting. More expansive, less prone to calculation. Again, we pay attention to the settings in Luke. We pay attention to the subjects that Jesus talks about. We pay attention to the revelations that happen in those times in this dining gospel. And we learn. We're trained. We learn that banquets are not for hardening and reinforcing social distinctions and hierarchies. We learn that feasts are not for the accumulation of debts or the repayment of debts or the keeping of debts in any way, shape, or form, but we learn that our luncheons and our dinners are really about transcendence, about enjoying the meal, but also seeing through, seeing beyond, seeing something more. This is part of our training. This is why we have the Eucharist. In some liturgies of the Eucharist, we ask the question from the Psalms, what shall we return to the Lord for all the good things that God has done for us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. What can we return? Nothing. We receive. We are fed. We rejoice. And we repeat over and over and over again. Our feasting, our banquets, this Mary may well be the shape of eternity. This is one of the things that Luke is trying to tell us. This is one of the things that Jesus is revealing to us. And God is training us to be people who can enjoy it now and forever.
Let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world. God of love, we pray for your church, for Michael, our presiding bishop, Greg, our bishop, for all lay and ordained ministers, and for all who seek you in the community of the faithful. Equip us with compassion and love to carry out your work of reconciliation in the world. God of love. Hear our prayers for the church. God of freedom, we pray for our nation and all the nations of the world, for peace and unity across barriers of language, color, and creed, for elected and appointed leaders that they would serve the common good, inspire all people with courage to speak out against hatred, to actively resist evil, unite the human family in bonds of love. God of freedom. Hear our prayers for the world. God of justice, we pray for the earth, your creation entrusted to our care, for the animals and birds, the mountains and oceans, and all parts of your creation that have voices we do not hear, see, or recognize. Stir up in us a thirst for justice that protects the earth and all its resources, that we may leave our children's children the legacy of beauty and abundance that you have given us. God of justice, Hear our prayers for the earth. God of joy, we pray for this community and thank you for the blessings of this life, especially for long haul truck drivers, for sunny weather, for a safe trip to visit family. For the beauty of the Pacific Northwest and the splendor of all God's creation, for our local leaders, for our schools and markets, for our neighborhoods and workplaces, Kindle gratitude in every heart. Grow in us a desire for equality, respect, and opportunity for all. God of joy. Hear our prayers for this community. God of mercy, we pray for all in any kind of need or trouble, especially Frankie, Janet Hubach, Janet, Janice Dampler, Doreen, Kimberly, John, Reed, Roberta, Colleen, David, Rita, the world. We pray for those whose lives are closely linked with ours and those connected to us as part of the human family, for refugees and prisoners, for the sick and suffering, the lonely and despairing, 
for those facing violence, for all held down by prejudice or injustice. Awaken in us compassion and humility of spirit as we seek and serve Christ in all persons. God of mercy. Hear our prayers for all who are in need. God of grace, we pray for those who have died, especially Johanna Hedge, Roland, Claudine, Naiko Hefner, Sadie, Bill Cushman, those who died in natural disasters, people that died by gun violence. For the faithful in every generation who have worked for justice, for prophets who called us to racial reconciliation, for martyrs who died because of hatred, and for all the community of saints. Make us faithful to your call to proclaim your good news by word and example, and bring us at last to the glorious company of the saints in light, God of grace. Hear our prayers for those who have died. O oh God, you made us in your own image and redeemed us through Jesus, your Son. Look with compassion on the whole human family. Take away the arrogance and hatred which infect our hearts. Break down the walls that separate us. Unite us in bonds of love and work through our struggle and confusion to accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time all nations and races may serve you in harmony around your heavenly throne. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of Christ be always with you. I would like to invite forward, you all can be seated, um, all of our folks who are going to be headed back or have already headed back to school this year. I, I, uh, Amara and Mary, Hazel, come on forward. I got a sticker. <laughs> They're nice stickers. <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Okay, so we've got a sticker for you to pick out. You can pick out either God's got your back or blessed to be a blessing. Which one would you like? Okay, how about you, Mary? Okay, how about you, Hazel? Okay, why don't you stick, if you all stick around with me for just a second, I've got a special prayer we're going to say, okay? So you've got your, got your bags. All right? So, we, be, oh, you are very honest. Thank you. Would you like to? Would you like to? Okay. Okay. So you guys are, well, Hazel's already started. 
uh, but you are headed back to school very soon. And I want you to remember that you go with the prayers of this church and with God's blessing. And so we'll have a little prayer, okay? And ask God's blessing on your on your backpacks, on your bags, and on you and your teachers and all who support you this year. So let us pray. God of wisdom, we thank you for schools and classrooms and for the teachers and students who fill them each day. We thank you for this new beginning of new books and new ideas. We thank you for sharpened pencils, pointy crayons, working tablets, and crisp blank pages waiting to be filled. We thank you for the gift of making mistakes and trying again. Help us to remember that asking the right questions is often as important as giving the right answers. Today, we give you thanks for these, these students and we ask you, you to bless them with curiosity, understanding, and respect. May their backpacks and bags be assigned to them that they have everything they need to learn and grow in this year in, in school as well as here at St. John's. May they be guided by your love. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, who as a child in the temple showed his longing to learn about you, and as an adult taught by story and example your great love for us. Amen. Amen. All right. We hope it's a great school year. Thank you all. You can go back to your seats. That is that's a good bag. Got it? great school year. I have faith. It's wonderful to be with you all this morning and welcome, especially if you happen to be visiting with us. We're very glad that you're here and we hope that you'll come and worship with us again. If you have any questions about St. John's, please feel free to reach out to me. My name is Elise. I'm the priest and I would be more than happy to talk with you about all the different things that are going on here, about the Episcopal tradition uh, and any questions you might have and also hear more about you and your journey. We have a few announcements. One thing is I would like to uh, give thanks for our guest preacher, someone who I know very well. Uh, <laughs> um, Ryan, thank you very much for preaching today. In addition to being my wonderful spouse, uh, Ryan is ordained in the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, which is an ecumenical partner to our Episcopal Church. We're not in full communion with the Presbyterian Church at, at this time, but we do have a number of partnerships uh, across uh, both denominations. There are actually a couple of combined Episcopal and Presbyterian churches here in the United States. One's in Ohio and another one is in Connecticut. Um, and I think many of you may remember that I serve on the Episcopal Presbyterian Dialogue for our two denominations, where we are working to deepen and, and uh, increase the number of partnerships and the ways that we can work together as, uh, as church bodies. And so I'm really glad not only to have Ryan preach, because I think he's a great preacher, but also uh, to have this embodiment of our Presbyterian Episcopal Partnership. Uh, Ryan made a joke when I was appointed to the Presbyterian Episcopal Dialogue. He said, you have a Presbyterian Episcopal Dialogue every day at your house. <laughs> um, we have just a few other announcements. Uh, one, it's not too late. Uh, we have just a couple weeks left for you to buy your tickets for the Grand Quilt Raffle. We will draw the winners uh, for the quilts on September 11th at our kickoff. Uh, and at our kickoff that is coming up and we will have a bouncy house oh last week's reaction was really great so uh, <laughs> uh, we'll have our bouncy house we'll have food uh, we're going to have um, some different sort of self-serve options as well as I'm excited to announce that cooking with Timmy is doing a pop-up 
for um, hamburgers, veggie burgers, and hot dogs. Uh, and so uh, we're working out the details about how that'll all work out, but it'll be a great day. And uh, in addition to the bouncy house and great food and fellowship, you'll be able to pick up your copy of Being Christian, which is our all parish read. And remember, it's not a long book. It's only 84 pages. Um, and so we'll begin that all parish read. Um, actually, the first chapter we'll discuss on the 25th of September, but you can see a schedule of our discussion times in the bulletin. So we'll be um, doing an intro on the Sunday the 18th and then an intro. Um, so that'll be in our Sunday mornings will be in person. Our Wednesday nights will be on Zoom and you can take a look at the schedule there in the bulletin. Um, and let's see here, and then the, in addition to our adult formation starting on the 18th, our children's formation is starting off uh, on the 18th as well. Um, and just a quick note about our parking lot service. Um, I have uh, been in touch with the great majority of our folks who are, have attended the parking lot service uh, regularly over these last couple of years, and I think we all discern that it's time uh, to come back in the building. And so um, the, the 830 service will be coming back into the building on September 11th. But next Sunday, the 4th, we're going to say some extra, some special prayers of thanksgiving uh, for all who have made the parking lot service possible, especially in that time where it really wasn't safe for us to worship together uh, in, in more traditional ways. And so if you want to say uh, uh, Godspeed and farewell to the parking lot service, you can come next Sunday at 8.30. So. Uh, also about the parking lot, some of you may have seen in the West Seattle blog um, that the West Seattle High School, uh, it is a very popular place for donut spinning, and I really wish that those were the donuts from a bakery, but they are not. Um, and so it does keep our neighbors up at night, uh, and so uh, the West Seattle High School uh, is, has basically said that they're going to put gates uh, in order to sort of limit access for cars into the lot. I met with the principal on Thursday and they're placing the gates in such a way that we will still have access to our parking lot and we'll also have a key. So on Sunday mornings, we can unlock the gate and people can park in the lot. And then at, when we're done, we'll close the gate and lock it back up. So. Um, so we will have access to the lot as our legal agreement um, says that we do on Sundays and on Christmas. Um, and we're in conversation with the uh, West Seattle High School on some other matters as well. But uh, just so you know, we are in conversation and I think it will actually be a good arrangement with the gates. And I think that's plenty, so I'm going to stop talking. We acknowledge that we are in the unceded traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish and the Suquamish people past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish and the Suquamish tribes. And please know that wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you have a place and a home at St. John the Baptist. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. I would invite you to stand as you're able and let us sing together, Tell Out My Soul, The Greatness of the Lord.
All things come from you, O God, and from your own have we given you. God be with you. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. For in these last days you sent Jesus to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In Christ you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember Christ's death, we proclaim Christ's resurrection, we await Christ's coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Savior of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through whom we are acceptable to you, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed John the Baptist, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your children. 
through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Disciples knew the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. The disciples knew the Lord Jesus in the breaking of the bread. The bread which we body of Christ, the bread of Christ. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
we offer this prayer for those who are worshiping at home during this time of communion. O Christ, I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament. And since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Amen. And continuing with the post-communion prayer, let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart, through Christ our Savior. Amen. My friends, let us depart from this place in peace, and as we go on our way, forget not the poor, pray for the sick, make no peace with oppression, and love one another in God as Christ has loved us, and the blessing of God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.